Nintendo's video, video, video game sophistry. Zero! Your one-stop shop for video games, news, reviews. Oh my god, he just ran in. And time-wasting fun. We spoke a few months ago with Fergus Urquhart, the head honcho at Obsidian Entertainment, about their upcoming Kickstarter product, Project Eternity. At that time, Project Eternity's funding was just getting started. Now it's all over, and we've come full circle to talk to Fergus once again. Thank you for taking the time. Oh, I would I t- really appreciate it. Now, got to be the first question. Funding stage is now over. How do you feel, and more importantly, how did you do? <laughs> well, well, if you'd asked me a couple of days ago, I said really tired. Um, yeah. But now, but now, uh, well, we were we were just we were just so excited and ecstatic mm-hmm. by by the amount we were able to fund, which ended up being um, as of that day, if we took the Kickstarter total and our um, the Kickstarter total and our PayPal total, it was about four point one. Four point one two or something like that. Four million, four million one hundred twenty thousand. And your uh, initial estimates of what you're going for? Well, our initial what we had put up was one point one million. So that that was our that was if that's all we could get, we could make a good game for the people that that you know that pledged at one point one million. So, but it's pretty amazing we were able to make it to four point one. For those who did miss out on the first cycle, we're hearing a lot. They're very very upset. Are they out of luck, or can they contribute and still get the game even though they missed the uh, the Kickstarter time frame? Actually, for a limited time, we still have our pay- the PayPal open. Um, we don't want to keep it open forever because you know we want to be- have it be special for the people who backed it during the Kickstarter time. But for a while, you can get to you can you can pledge at eternity.obsidian.net. Okay, and of course that will be available underneath this video. So if you're scrambling to find it, you can still get this game. Uh, how is this process compared to other development cycles? Because this is a first for you. This is kind of a revolutionary way of making games. Now that you've gone through the funding stage of it, can you right. speak to that a little bit? How did it differ from you know different uh, development cycles? You know, I think you know because now that we've kind of gone through the funding, you know, what's going to be different is really the fact that we're we're publishing it mm-hmm. um, ourselves in a lot of ways. So so that's going to have to that's going to be something. Uh, that's a little bit different. The development side is, you know, we're making a game, and we've a lot of us have been making games for 20 years. So I would say that on the, on the development side, the difference is we want to make sure that we continue to keep everybody in the loop and keep everybody aware and keep, you know, really invite people into the development process. Mm-hmm. So we're working, so we're working on how we're going to do that right now. We're going to have a website, particularly one for backers, that just kind of we do, we're going to do a lot of web logs and release a lot of concept information and design documentation, all that kind of stuff. On the publishing side, what's helpful there is actually a lot of us for I worked for a publisher for almost 12 years, mm-hmm. and so we, while it was on the development side, it's something we're pretty aware of, and we have obviously a lot of contact yeah. in the publishing world. So, so I think we'll be fine there, but it is definitely that's going to be something different about making this game. You spoke to it a little bit there with the funding over. It's very important to express how the fans are going to be involved in the upcoming decisions. You mentioned that you have the the website uh, coming up. What are some other ways that you're making sure the fans who did contribute still have a voice in making this game that they obviously love so much? Um, well, what we have is we have our forums, mm-hmm. and you know everybody has forums. But, but we we've, we've done a you know we've worked very hard over the years to pretty much we need to be constantly sort of involved with our community and, and with, mm-hmm. you know, with everybody that, 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 you know, that is interested in our games. And so we're just going to step that up. So we have the forums and, you know, I was just up there online last night uh, and there was, you know, there's about 600 people online at that point in time. Uh, we're going to continue to, on the Kickstarter site, there's a comment section. Uh, we're going to continue to be up there, not as much as we were, but, you know, at least yeah. every day mm-hmm. uh, and, you know, at least once a day. And then also we can, you know, getting messages through Kickstarter, messages through Facebook, messages through Twitter, and we're just going to keep up on that stuff every day. Okay, so there is the continued, it's not the funding's now over, now we're going to work on it. It's they're <laughs> going to be involved sort of thing. Right, absolutely. Because this is such a revolutionary way of producing games, it's kind of on the spot, but are there some new and innovative design measures that the massive community of, I think it's much more than 75,000 contributors, are there anything that you've read or heard that's been suggested that maybe you've never considered for the vision of Project Eternity? That's a good question. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I think a lot of it, it, what's interesting about RPG fans is like, you know, we all, like RPGs are this this, this huge, broad you know, genre that's also based on all the pen and paper, like Dungeons and Dragons and, and all the all the RPGs that have been made over the years. And so I don't want to say there's not any new ideas. That's not the case. It's just a lot of what we do is very much based upon, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we we kind of brought this part of like how the world works into the game. And so a lot of mm-hmm. a lot of fun like I mean an example like someone was talking in, in the comment section the other day, hey, wouldn't it be cool if um and this is gonna sound kind of 
kind of dorky, I guess, but, but it, you know, wouldn't it be cool that instead of when I come back to sell off my, my, I, my loot, um, instead I can kind of invest it that, that in a business for, for the, in essence, always love that yeah. to buy mm-hmm. for people to buy instead of, you know, me just selling it to the store. So it's still like the computer is still running this whole economic, you know, uh, mm-hmm. algorithm, uh, but then, the, you know, the store can make money and then it could build up and things like that. And I would say, I don't think we've ever considered doing something like that. Um, and so it's kind of, we were actually talking about it and it could be an interesting thing to do. The first time we spoke, a lot of Project Eternity was still up in the air, the overall vision for it. Now with the funding campaign over, you've had a lot more time to examine the game and kind of map out, I would say, of what you expect. What can you tell us about your vision for the game? What can we expect uh, a little while from now? Well, I think the thing that that what is great with the amount of uh, funding that we're able to get was, you know, init- you know, is to really create a a f- very full, fleshed out, robust, big game, you know. And mm-hmm. I think that's that's really what's exciting. I mean, RPGs are about scope. I think that's a lot of the that's the that, I don't know. If, it's not a it's not a bullet point you put on the back of the box. You just you know you know the little the little bullet and says big. You know you don't <laughs> <Yeah>. you don't <laughs> you don't say that. But a lot of but a lot of what uh, that's what RPG is about. And I think that's what's awesome with what we're able to do is we can do a lot of classes. We can do a lot of races. We can have two big cities. We can you know we can do this big dungeon. We can do we can really make this a big fleshed out game, uh, which is you know which is ultimately I think what everybody will really enjoy. What would you say is the biggest and most important improvement? to the game that you can now include thanks to the uh, additional revenue that you earn from Kickstarter? You know, I think uh, for me it's the stronghold. So I mm-hmm. think that I really enjoy, how, you know, and I think a lot of players do, and, and so I'm maybe too, it's too, too personal or selfish here, but I really like this idea of having your own place in the world that has its own story and, and that you, 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 in essence, you invest your time in, you choose how you want it to develop, you choose, you know, it's going to, you know, we're looking at is it's going to, you know, is it going to get attacked during the game? We're not sure, but that mm-hmm. would be really cool because you can invest in soldiers to protect it, you know, and you're sort of, you, you get to actually be this guy that's in charge of this, this, the, you know, this, this part of the world. And, um, you know, and, and that would have been very hard if we had just made our initial, you know, our, our mm-hmm. core funding. So being able to add that is, I think, is, is, is a lot of fun. In terms of the overall narrative, can you give us a, a brief summary? Tell us a little bit more about the world of Brunch Eternity. Well, actually, what we're still we're still working on that a lot. That's actually what Josh is is Josh is the project director, mm-hmm. and uh, he was also the project director in Fallout New Vegas, and that's really what he's working on a lot. And mm-hmm. so now that we kind of know, like, oh, what can we do? <laughs> yeah. That now that now that now that brings into okay, we can include these races, and we can have these classes, and these com- number of companions, and everything. And now that's really what he's been working on. You know, pretty much since. Um, uh, you know, uh, you know, since Monday morning, as we really got an understanding of where we were with everything, that's he's pretty much been closed up in his office doing that, mm-hmm. and uh, which also it's great because we were able to bring in uh, George Zeitz on and uh, who used to work, who used to work with us, mm-hmm. and uh, with that, we're really going to be able to flesh out the world, and that's some of the stuff that we're going to be releasing very early. Is you know, this is the size of the world, this is the part of the world that we're going to be in. These are the important areas of it. These are kind of the key players in it, uh, and and let everybody know that pretty soon. Okay, so that's coming down the barrel pretty. Soon, there and exactly. there are going to be specifics in terms of what it is, you know, the key areas, like you said. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, Excellent. Yeah. I, I think Obsidian is really famous for making NPCs in gaming. I do it better than anyone else. Can you give us any details on the different array of followers, the dogs, the monsters, everything they'll be traveling <laughs> with us? <laughs> I, yeah, no, I think, well, I think the key, I mean, the key thing that we try to do there is we always try to make sure that there are a good combination of, so if there's, any, you know, there's, there's a certain number of classes in the game and there's a certain number, you know, and there's obviously for each race and, and then there's the male and female. And what we do is we always try to look and go, okay, so um, if I choose this class, this race, this sex for my, my character, mm-hmm. there needs to be then able to flesh out the party if I want to play with any of the other classes or races or things like that. Mm-hmm. There has to be a good number of combinations. You can't do all the combinations because that's impossible. Yeah. Um, and, I, and that was probably one thing that people, people really wanted to see us add another companion, you know, I think we're at eight right now, and they mm-hmm. really wanted to see us nine or even more. And, and that was one where we're, we're going to look at it, we're going to try to figure it out. But, the, you know, as you were saying, we're, really, we're known for NPCs, and, and they are the most in time-intensive design, individual design element that I think we have ever do, and maybe anybody ever does yeah. in this industry. Because it takes, like, someone who's Chris Avalon, who's mm-hmm. the, he's one of, one of the founders of Obsidian as well, and he was the lead designer on Torment. It takes him, if it is very, it's a very big, robust, it takes him just an initial two or three months mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. just to do the writing yeah. and and get and get most of the stuff in it. So that's really what we're doing. So we're sort so it's 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 you know it's coming out with the right combinations, and if we can do more, we're going to do more. But it's it's uh, we don't want to kind of extend ourselves and just and just you know throw more in just mm-hmm. for to to add to the numbers. I think even Obsidian has even more issue because you add these really robust features like low intelligence characters yeah. or the ability for NPCs to die forever. So imagine that I'm just considering the variables of the <laughs> overall narrative when you have all of these different permutations yeah. of the main character. Um, I think well, we've heard it before, but are you considering the, you know, the permadeath for the NPCs, the low intelligence, the things that the, I think, original Obsidian games, the Black Isle games at the time, right. were made so great and made them so addictive and wonderful. Right. Well, I think the thing is, is I mean, uh, games have changed a little bit since yeah. then, and it's not, and it's not that, you know, and it's one of those things we have to think about what's right for it. So, so it's, it's that, is it about the player playing someone who goes, ugh, or uh, ooh? Mm-hmm. And, and while that was, I think, entertaining in Fallout, it's still a conversation here, is that, that does that make sense in the type of game mm-hmm. and the story that we're trying to tell? You know, and I think in the, I think in the end, when it comes to, you know, particularly with the companions and permadeath and things like that, you know, it's something that, you know, it's a, it's, it's what RPGs are all about options and about choice, right? Mm-hmm. And so, and even in choice and how you want to play this version of the game. And I think that's what's, that's what's really important. And so, and that's something, you know, that Josh, Josh really feels strongly about. And so, and so it's something you can turn on, you know, and, and, and you know, sometimes people think that, you know, adding options to a game is just a designers or, or game developers not making a choice. <laughs> yeah. We'll just give players a choice. But we're not going to make the choice for them. But I, in the case of an RPG, I think that's appropriate. You know, mm-hmm. when I go back to the D&D games, you know, we, we made a choice in Icewind Dale that, you know, what was on at the start with max hit points. So, you know, D&D was yeah. this idea that you roll for hit points. But we actually had it on by default that you got max hit points. A lot of times because the wizards would just get killed in the first seven minutes of the game, and, yeah. that, and that's pretty defe- – you know. but for the people who wanted the, the, the true D&D feeling, you could turn that off, and then, and then it would roll for hit points on a pro-level basis. Mm-hmm. And so that's really what you – know, that's, that's, that's kind of how we look at it. And so with permadeath, it's, it's a you, – if you want that experience, you can have that experience, and, and we'll let you have it. And, but then we also know, because we have to like, when, but when you, you, we also know the side effect of that for yes. players is mm-hmm. if they then do turn something on like permadeath, what that's maybe all, all, all it's really doing is it makes them reload more. Yeah. And so that's the thing we're trying to really, you know, I mean, so we're going to offer it, but we know kind of the, what the impact. You've is. done it before and you realize how people play with it sort of thing. Exactly. So that's mm-hmm. the thing. But, but for the people who really want that experience, and okay, and want it like, oh, if he dies, he dies, and I'm gonna make that happen. Mm-hmm. Well, then they can they can they can play the game that way. Who are trying to call back to the original uh, follow playthroughs where it was one save, you know, yeah. not, hardest difficulties. Anyone dies, can't do anything about it. Not allowed to have certain amount of weapons. I, again, the the really hardcore in the Obsidian fan base, if you will. Yeah, yeah, no, and and I think well, even a lot of games. I mean, they have the you know the Iron Man mode. And yeah. They can, in, 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 in hardcore mode and follow New Vegas, a companion died, they died, right? Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, and, and people want that experience for it because it, it creates a different way of playing the game. I mean, I think that was... What Even was for a short period of time, too. I, th- I find yeah. that a lot, too. Yes, exactly. So it's just a... It makes you just approach... Like, you've bought this game and you get one experience from it, mm-hmm. and then you can play it again, again with this setting on, which, you know, when you read it, you're like, oh, okay, that makes it, okay, I got some different stuff going on. Mm-hmm. But then it really changes your experience of how you play the game and how you have to think and how you have to approach it. And not just from a, oh, it's harder standpoint. No, it actually changes how you look, how you go through the game, which I think is pretty awesome. Yeah. You get, not that you're getting two games for one or anything like that, but you're definitely getting a way to experience it in a very different way. I think um, something that's very interesting for all the fans now at this point to really know what your plan is now because you made very specific goals and outlines of where the revenue from Kickstarter was going, how right. fans would be involved. Now we get into the development phase. What are your big next steps of what you can express? Because I always think that's very interesting of saying now that we have it, we have to actually make the game. So what are the essentially the first steps for Project Eternity at this point? Right. So what we have to break down is, is we're, we just we, we're going to break the game down into the into sort of the, the complex things that we have to solve. Right. That we have to. Sorry, I want to say complex. The, mm-hmm. the 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 longer paths of of things that we need to accomplish so that we can get to making levels of the game. So that's mm-hmm. a lot of what I usually we talk about is that 
what we want to in our, all of our games, we want to get to the point where it's, where we're, it's like we're making an expansion pack. So mm-hmm. one of the things in, in, in any when you're making games is, is expansion packs are easy is the wrong term. It's just more that like everyone's used to the tools. The engine is now mostly finished. You have a lot of assets that you can use, and now you can just kind of go make. And that's why expansion packs are like teams often like to work on expansion packs, mm-hmm. or even a publisher will have a, you know, a newer developer do the expansion pack for a game that the more experienced developer had made because it's, it's, not, as, it's, not, it's not as risky of a thing. Yeah, the tools so are already there. You, you the put the groundwork sort of thing, yeah. Absolutely. So mm-hmm. now what we're doing is going, okay, so what are the big things that we need to make sure that we get done so that when we get to production on Project Eternity, it's like making an expansion pack? And, so, and really that's the thing. So, and, that's, and so a lot of it, there's going to be a lot of conversation in the, in, uh, in the game. So we've already gotten our conference conversation tool brought over into Unity and reading and writing data into Unity. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't actually talk to anyone yet, but that's just the very next step. Then the next thing is, okay, what's the, what's the level design path? Like, in other words, what, do, what are all the tools that the level designers need, and what's the, order, the best order in which to create them, and how are we going to do this levels? Like, we all know how the, or a lot of us know, like, how levels and everything worked in the Infinity Engine from mm-hmm. the standpoint of the data behind them. Do we want to do the data all the same way? Do we want to do it differently? And we've already made a lot of those decisions, but that's the, that's the kind of thing we are right now. Is like you know, is to say, okay, so what what where do we keep it simple? <laughs> mm, yeah. And, and how you know how a you know a ten twelve year old engine did it, and how do we do use something that maybe does sort of newer technology or new game making um, new experience that we have? So that's really where we are right now. It's 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 getting all of these big systems moving forward, um, level making. Uh, animation, animation in RPGs is just—it's crazy because you you have all these different size characters and you have all these different weapon sets and you know you, mm-hmm. you know you can't swing a dagger like you swing a two-handed sword. Yeah. And so you need all these different animation sets and and you know and 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 so you have to go okay so how do we do this across this many races and this many classes and have unique things in that and so that's a big focus right now. And what's great is actually the animation tools in Unity 4 are that are awesome and mm-hmm. and that's that's helping us out a lot. A lot. I think I'm very lucky because I'm in a position where I can talk as a fan, as a contributor. I can talk directly to the head-on show, and my one of my favorite components, I would say, of Obsidian Game was involved in the game Alpha Protocol. Okay. When you were able to find case information, to find that added little bonus of information, then actually use that to add interesting and compelling new narrative choices was something that blew my mind when I originally <laughs> played the game. I, something I've never really seen before in a game, yeah. and it's something I wanted from other sorts of games. Now, I'm again, this is pleading, asking, is there any chance of a similar sort of logic being implemented in uh, Project Eternity? Yes, but it might not be to the extent, and, yeah. and, there's, a re- and there's a reason for that. Mm-hmm. So, Alpha Protocol, it wasn't a specifically linear game, mm-hmm. but, it, but it was more linear than a lot of our other games. And when a game is more linear, it makes the, it makes the, the sort of the, the influence trees. Um, you can kind of continue to move them forward and not have to worry about how, like, a decision this far in the story affects oh, yeah. mm-hmm. this other area way over here. Mm-hmm. And so, and so I think the thing with Project Tourney, we want it to be a little bit more nonlinear in that you can kind of choose to go where you want to go. And so what we do then is it just, what I, in essence, probably the better way to explain it is that a lot of the things that are going to happen are, is, is there's going to be a lot of global stuff, mm-hmm. but like, for instance, in like the Fallout games and, and even in, in Baldur's Gate and, and stuff like that, you know, a lot of the effect you're going to have is, is going to be local to sort of like a big city. Mm-hmm, and, yeah. and so that when you're doing the stories in those big city, then there's a lot of effect of who you're talked to and what you've done and this thing and that thing. And you found this and it, it, and it you know, now brings up these dialogue choices. But it's not like the, you know, the, all 500 things you do in that big city when you go mm-hmm. to a village on the other side of the world, not all 500 of those things are, you're going to see as – reacted in that mm-hmm. village, but you're going to see certain big things, and that's what's really important, is that uh, the big effects that you have on the world and the factions and individual key people in the world, that will carry out across the whole world, 
um, making sure that you know the, the, the world is not only moving, the timeline feels like it's moving forward or is moving forward. Similar to something like in Fallout 2 where, depending on your actions in Vault City, when you go to NCR, you won't hear every specific incident, but the things you did with the big players in that were yeah, obviously affected. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what we think is really important. It's just that, is that the, the game world reacts to the reacts to the big things that you do, you know, because then it feels like, because it's true, because it makes us then, even as the game makers go, okay, well, we can't, none of this stuff is in isolation, you know, little stuff is, like mm -hmm. you, you took, you got the cat out of the tree, right? Yeah. But mm -hmm. I mean, um, unless it was someone's important cat, but whatever, you know, and, uh, and so. Imagine so a lot that, you have to ask yourself that as a game maker too, is that an important <laughs> game? <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I mean that's the thing is it makes us go okay. But this, all these things that we're doing right now, that mm -hmm. that stuff that's important and it's big and it's something that people in this world would talk about. So, like, does that make sense? Would it? How would it affect the city over here? And then that changes actually could change how the individual designers actually are designing parts of those cities based upon how the timeline and how we're seeing the effect of of, of how the player is interacting uh, with factions and how they're deciding to uh, how their choices. Mm -hmm. Absolutely fascinating. You make games right, sir. That is excellent. <laughs> uh, finally, when can we expect the next big update of information for the game? And it's always the sort of question, how many several months must we suffer before we can finally get our hands on it? <laughs> <laughs> so we're slated for spring 2014. Um, we have to admit that our funding was a lot more than what we expected, mm -hmm. and so there, we're putting a lot more in the game. Our intention is not to move that date very much, but it's but for us, and I think everybody that 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 backed Project Eternity, you know, it's important that the game is awesome, mm -hmm. and so uh, you know, and so we're we're really kind of what we're now is we're looking at like how many more people can we put on the team, but we don't want to make it a giant team that maybe becomes inefficient, and so we're really balancing, and you know, because our goal is, our goal in the end is the game, it's that's it. So and if mm -hmm. that means a little bit more time, then it probably will be a little bit more time. But we're we're but you know I know I know when I, I brought that up before, some people go, oh you're already talking about flipping. I go, no, I'm not talking about flipping. Yeah. <laughs> we just like the equation. You just got double or triple <laughs> the amount that you thought you. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the equation changed a lot, and so we just yeah. need to we just need to solve it again. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Really appreciate it. Just fascinating stuff. Well, thank you very much. Well, there you have it. Project Eternity is on pace. If you haven't gotten it yet, you still have that small window within the PayPal. Again, that link will be available underneath. A game you really shouldn't miss. I'm Andy Burkowski for Video Game Sophistry.